Let's go. Speed run time. Roll the cameras. We're white. Now we're going to go d4. We played d4 earlier. I want to bore you guys to death with some positional stuff. So let's play some d4 openings in the next couple of games with white. Okay, so here we can play a bunch of different things. We can play a London system. We can play a Trumpowski. But let's play the main line. Let's play c4. Okay, so he plays g6. That's either the King's Indian or the Grunfeld. We go knight c3, of course. Okay, King's Indian. And we are playing against the King's Indian. Okay, so he castles. Now, the interesting thing about this move, if you've watched a bunch of King's Indian game, you'll know that d6 is generally the move. But castles is fine. And the move e5, which aims to punish black, is bad. And it's known to be bad ever since Bobby Fischer won a very famous game in, the, in that line in, in the 60s. So we want to play this exactly as we would play a normal King's Indian. And the line that I recommend to almost everybody, um, to almost everybody in this rating range, 1700, is the same-ish. I think the same-ish is the easiest line to understand. The ideas are very clear. And it's the most dangerous line against somebody who's not very well versed in King's Indian theory. Black can get checkmated really, really easily. So we're going to play the move f3. Okay, so d6. So the point of f3 is twofold, threefold. We're obviously reinforcing the e4 pawn. We are preparing at a later point the pawn storm involving g4. And we are in the same vein preventing the knight from coming to g4, which is important because we now develop our bishop to e3. e5. So the ideal scenario in the same-ish goes as follows. We want to close down the center. We want to go queen d2 and castle long. And then we want to checkmate him Sicilian style on the king side. We want to go bishop h6, h4, h5, hg, and mate him. So black has to stop us from doing these things in that order. And that's not as easy as it seems. So the move e5 is the old school main line. That's the old fashioned main line. Uh, and what should we do here? How should we continue? Yeah, so we should go d5, closing down the center. That's the first uh, first step. And c6 uh, is indeed the correct, the correct move. Okay, so now we aim to accomplish the second step of our mission, which is to castle along. We need to tuck our king away. Queen to d2. Cd will play cd. Okay, bishop d7 is very awkward. I'm not sure I understand what he's trying to do with that move. It deprives the knight of its natural developing square. Okay, so obviously now we're going to castle and complete our uh, the sort of second stage of our plane. It goes b5. So I think his heart is in the right place here. He's trying to attack on the queen side, but the wheels are going to come off pretty quickly. So we can play cb. That's pretty much fine. But I think there's an even better version of this. We can do what else? How else can we do this, essentially? Yeah, we can play dc. That exposes a very weak pawn on d6. And we're going to end up taking b5 uh, in a very, very good version. So aren't we opening up the center when I just said we should keep it closed? Well, the circumstances have changed. He's given us a pawn. And the great thing about the same is that it's a very structurally healthy opening. So it's not like by opening the center, you're exposing yourself somehow, right? We're perfectly well developed. Our center is under, is in very good hands. What should we take the pawn with? And this is a pretty tricky question because I talked about this a lot yesterday, the concept that a lot of people want to make moves that carry threats. So I think a lot of you will be tempted to take with the pawn, but you should take with a knight. And the reason why is that taking with the pawn, first of all, opens up the C file, and only he can benefit from that. And in addition, uh, he will be able to play the move knight to d4. And I'll talk a little bit about that after the game. This is definitely the best move. And finally, yeah, we're, we're attacking d6 with three different pieces, the rook, the queen, and the knight. a5. He continues trying to attack, but he's grasping at straws here. There's really nothing to attack. Now, what should we do? Well, time to reap the reap the harvest. 
Obviously, we should take this pawn. There's no need not to, and we should take with the queen. Let's take it with the queen swooping in, really paralyzing him with our two pieces. And if he moves the bishop, then we'll get a chance to trade queens, which is great for us because we're now up two pawns. This is just... Knight takes d6 was also very much possible. I don't think it really matters. It's you know, Both moves seem perfectly good. And this is just horrific for black. Well, knight b4 is a good move. That's a, that's a good try. So he's... I mean, he's attacking the a2 pawn, and there's no need to give that pawn away. So what should we do? What's the simplest move? Yeah, just a3. Chase the knight away. We could also go king to b1. That's a good prophylactic move. But a3 comes with tempo, so I like it a little bit more. Our king is perfectly safe on c1. It's not like he's going to do anything with it. And now... Um, after he moves the knight, bishop g5 is coming. Yeah, so what we're noticing here is that the bishop on d7 is defended by the queen and is defended by the knight. We've got a very convenient move that pins the knight and threatens to win the bishop by taking the knight. And the only way he can defend against that is by moving his bishop, which allows in turn the queen trade. <clears throat> knight c6. And bishop g5. That seems very reasonable. Now, against another GM, I would probably develop my knight and bring it over to c3 just to beef up the security on the king side. But here we can go in for the kill. I don't really mind. I hope this is making sense. This is this should be pretty straightforward to everybody. Rook c8. And what do we do now? He's not effectively doing anything against our threat. Now, why did we play bishop g5? Let's remember. Ah, it was to take on f6. And then uh, the bishop on d7 is toast. Boom. Now, he's going to play queen b6 here, after which it's going to be very important to be cautious for a couple of moves because, remember, we're still quite undeveloped. I mean, our whole king side is undeveloped. So, you know, it's like we've won a lottery ticket... But we're, you know, in a war zone and we need to escape the war zone and then we can cash a lottery ticket in and we can live happily ever after. So we just need to survive for a couple of moves. And this is a very dangerous period for a lot of players. This is where a lot of players go wrong. So we need to identify what the sources of danger are. What are the immediate problems? What are the threats? What is Black's actual threat here? Yeah, so rook d8, and we should also be aware of the possibility of bishop g5 check, which could disattach the king from the rook, so rook d8 would actually then be a devastating pin. So we can't cover the d8 square, but um, what can we do? How can we take the sting out of preferably both of these moves? We can play a very simple move. Okay, bishop e2 is okay it defends the rook but i would still be very concerned about rook fd8 we'd have to bring our queen to the side and i really want our queen to be participating in the defense so what you guys a lot of you are proposing moves like queen g4 which is not bad but again you don't have the luxury of abandoning your king you have to keep your king your queen close to your chest so queen to d2 is going to be the best move and i'll talk about knight d6 knight d6 rook he would move the other rook to d8 i think or even rook fd8 would still be very strong. So what's the logic here? A lot of you are, are, I think, instinctively avoiding this move because rook fd8 comes with tempo. It attacks the queen. But remember what I said yesterday. The same tip comes in handy again and again. You shouldn't be afraid of a move only because it creates a threat to one of your heavy pieces, queen or king. This move is no longer dangerous because our queen has a million different squares from where it will defend the rook. We can go queen c2, we can go queen e1. Um, I'm trying to choose between those moves. I like queen c2 uh, because you really just, you know, uh, stay together with your king, queen c2. Knight d6 would be very dangerous. It would walk into a pin. So if he goes knight d4, we just take his knight. 
I think it's possible that he does it. We just take his knight. And the pawn on c4 is perfectly well defended. Yeah, he does it. Okay, now one final move after which we fully consolidate and we're ready to develop. What we certainly don't want to allow him to do is to open up this bishop with d3. That would be a nasty little pawn sacrifice, and so we should take this opportunity to play bishop d3. And we can breathe easy. We're good. Our king is relatively safe. We're going to get our knight out, and we're just going to convert our extra piece. Okay, so that took like four moves, uh, but we had to be super accurate in those four moves. Check. King b1 is a move we wanted to play anyway, so the check is no longer dangerous. He can try to alakine gun me, but this pawn on b2, we're going to find the way to defend it. It's not going to be an issue. One of the ways that we can... Yeah, that's what he's trying to do. Now, before we do anything, let's complete our development. Let's, let's bring our knight out so that we have access to all of our pieces. Bishop e3. That's a good move. He's playing well. Okay, so how do we go about converting the, the advantage, uh, the extra piece? Well, um, first of all, I would address the potential issue of him tripling on the b-file. And I would ask myself what we can do about that. And one thing that we can do about that is make sure that we have the capacity, if necessary, but only if necessary, to protect the b2 pawn. What reshuffling of our pieces can we... Yeah, king a1. King a1 is a great prophylactic move so that if necessary, we can bring our rook over to b1 and our king is as safe as it gets here. King a2 would be a little bit less accurate because the queen could later come into b3 with check, which may become important at some later point if we like abandon c2 for whatever reason. You always got to take care of those eventualities. Damn, girl. Nice. That's, that is the ultimate. We, we, we might play king a2 if we ever need to defend the a3 pawn. And now, as many of you suggested, let's not forget that this is the same-ish. What do we do in the same-ish? Let's start attacking. Nothing happened to the prospect of us orchestrating a kingside attack. So we're not afraid of rook b8 anymore. We can just go h5. We can rip open the h file. And now we go rook b1. Now, rook takes b2. Maybe some of you are a little bit worried about this move. But I've calculated it. Rook takes b2, rook takes b2. Queen takes a3, check is just a paper tiger. We go rook a2 and the game is over. He doesn't have enough fuel for the fire. Rook b3 is a really nice move though. And now the necessity has arisen uh, for us to bring our king up to a2. So, you know, the, the circumstances change and he goes a4, man, this guy is really good. But he has no threats here. So let's take. This guy is definitely tremendously good. Okay, now we want to lock this bishop up on e3. So let's play the move f4. And our idea is to go e5. And already I'm uh, eyeing a bishop sacrifice on g6. That might just rip open his king. I hope that makes sense. I just don't see any way for him to... If he had one more piece, if he had a bishop on d6, for example, but we don't let his bishop get out then he would threaten a sacrifice on a3 with mate. As it stands, I'm not scared because I've literally verified that he has zero ideas on the queen side. He's run out of firepower. The position looks intimidating, but there's nothing concretely. And the, the, we've reached a level where, where you have to think very concretely in most positions. You can't just say, ah, this looks scary. Otherwise, you're just not going to be able to properly test your opponent and call, call their bluff. Queen c7. Okay, just making sure this doesn't pose any threats. It doesn't. So how should we follow up? I just mentioned this move, but who wants to remind me of the, the best continuation? e5, for sure. And now we're almost definitely threatening a sack on g6. That's going to be totally devastating. We can also follow, follow through with f5. Yeah, he defends. That's nice. But now we can recruit this bishop and... We have several ways, I think, to win this game. Now, the simplest is just to play f5, I think. The simplest is just to play f5 and use the pawns as battering rams. We want to get rid of this g-pawn so that this bishop-queen battery would uh, come into full effect. 
Yeah. There were many ways to win the game. Bishop e4 was also possible. Yeah, that was my second idea, bishop e4, and then walk the bishop over to d5. And then some sort of sack on h7 might decide the game, but I decided not to be adventurous. We'll win this in a more conventional way. Okay, so he takes, that doesn't do anything. It only helps us by opening the g-file. So let's just take on g6. Okay, so again, it doesn't matter at this point how you decide to win. There are a million ways. The simplest, and oftentimes in such positions, you don't want to reinvent the wheel, particularly when you've got a minute and a half left or something like that. Um, uh, this is not alcohol, that's tea. Even simpler than bishop e4, just take the pawn, take the pawn, open up the entire um, area of the king side, and and then you can swoop in with queen f5 or, or give a check on f7 or h7 and something's going to lead to me. One other idea is then to drop the bishop back to e4, move it away to d5, and that also opens up the diagonal for the queen. The king is wide open. Queen back. Okay, so again, just verifying that this is not a threat, takes, takes, and let's go with our initial idea. Let's drop the bishop back to e4, reroute it to d5, and that's going to be all she wrote. Yeah, this guy was underrated. I mean, he was certainly a very tough opponent. Queen d7, check. And time for the king hunt to begin. Time for the king hunt to begin. It's going to end very, very quickly. So in such positions, my one piece of advice is not to rush to give the first check that you see. And I know that the first check a lot of you might see is a rook f1 check. But when, you've, when you're hunting the king, you got to be very, very careful that you don't let the king escape. And you've got to chart where the escape, you've got to build the map. How could the king hypothetically escape? What is the pathway? And then you could tailor your sequence to prevent the king from reaching that pathway. So the pathway here is e8, d8, c7. If the king reaches c7, we're in a little bit of trouble. So first we need to prevent the king from coming to e8. Well, is there a way to do that? There is. You just give a check on h8. The king has to go up to e7, but now all of the squares are covered. Bishop covers e6, pawn covers d6, rook covers the eighth rank. All we need is one more check and that's gonna be mate. Is there a mate here? There is checkmate. All right. There we go. And that wins the game. I didn't mean to make it seem like it's close. I, I saw the mate when we were giving the check. All right, that was a nice game. So f3, yeah, now the, the Fisher game went e5, knight e8, f4, and Bobby basically crushed up White's pawn chain with d6 and c5. And uh, this is just no good for White. So don't go e5. Don't go e5 here. I mean, you can, and if Black doesn't know how to punish it, then it turns out to be really good. But um, if you want to play it properly, you should play the same way you would against d6. Okay, so d6, this is all good. e5 is fine. d5, c6, yeah, let's Leah Fisher. Queen d2. So bishop d7 is the first mistake. Um, the, the way to play this line is to play a6 and basically prepare b5. So white castles. I've had a couple of games in this line with black. I used to play this line with black. You develop your knight, you go b5, you go queen a5. But white is better here. I mean, if white plays it properly, you want to throw in king b1 just, just for just for kicks, and then you want to basically start attacking. h4, g4, bishop h6, all that stuff. So, what's up, man? So this is, I would say, not the best line for black, but it's pretty reputable, and it's not easy to refute. Okay, so bishop d7, castles, uh, and b5 is well-intentioned, but just wrong for tactical reasons. It just doesn't work. So dc uh, cuts the whole 
you know, mechanism down. Yeah, E5 is E5 definitely is legitimate. It's just not the best line. It's not bad, but it's I think white is better there. Okay, knight takes c6. So yeah, so basically the game was already over after knight takes b5. We just take another pawn, chase the knight away, and then we win the knight. I mean, this just was boom, 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 and the game is over. Um, okay. Now, um, that was basically it. I mean, he had some ways of saving the game. Maybe a6 here and then bishop e6, something like this, to climb out of the pin was better. But by and large, this was just already over before it began. All right. Okay, guys, I'm going to call it a day. So thanks, guys. Uh, take care, everybody. And, and I'll see you guys soon. Uh, thanks again for the support. I'll, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye.